Just like that, it finished. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome everybody to UFI Connect number 44. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all with us. Thank you for joining wherever you are. Um, so before I get going today, yes, just a, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, please, as, as everybody uh, type in the chat where you're joining from us today, um, we shall be the, the usual rules whereby if you want to ask a question of our speakers, please do it in the chat and the UFI um, team will, will come and get you ready for that. Um, before we start, I just want a couple of housekeeping notes. So firstly, to some exciting news from yesterday that we launched a new certification for the exhibition industry, uh, the UCP, um, UFI Certified Professional. So we've been offering uh, education programs for the last several years, which uh, some of you may know about and may have taken part in. Um, now you can, if you use one of our core programs, either the Venue Management School or the Exhibition Management School, you can twin that with some other uh, education programs, either offered by UFI or some of our partners. Um, so we have Rego, we have uh, MBB Media and the Virtual Event Institute, and this all goes towards uh, the UCP. So please look at that on our website, ufi.org slash education slash UCP. Finally, um, just to mention some dates for your diaries, uh, which are our uh, UFI events in the remainder of this year. So we have our regional conferences that come up in the second quarter, typically. Um, firstly, on the 20th of May, we have our Asia Pacific conference. Um, on, due to ongoing travel restrictions, that will be a digital event one day. Uh, the week after that, however, we will be meeting again for the first time um, since the pandemic began in Dubai. Our UFI MEA conference will take place at the Dubai World Trade Center uh, on Wednesday, the 26th of May. So we'll be launching the website for that and opening registration, I believe, next week. Um, but please, you know, if, if you can make it there, it would be wonderful to see you all. After that, we have the European Conference uh, on the 9th and 10th of June. We, would we were hoping to be in Poznan this year, but again, uh, due to ongoing situation in Europe, that will be a digital event. It will be two half days, the 9th and 10th of June. Um, a lot of fun in store and some great speakers lined up, so please join us for then. And of course, our UFI Congress will be the 3rd to the 6th of November this year in Rotterdam. And again, this will be live, so um, hopefully we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible there. Great, so on to today. I'm really looking forward to, to this session. Um, obviously, you know, here in Europe, there are, it's a mixed um, outlook, you know, in some parts of the, uh, of the continent, uh, there's the, the looming third wave and, and increased restrictions, you know, when we look at Germany or France, for example. However, it's, it's not the case across the board. Here in the UK, it's a much brighter outlook. We're steaming ahead with the vaccination programme, uh, meaning that we're on course for our easing of restrictions. And June the 21st should be a relaxing of all restrictions if things keep going the right direction. Um, and you may have seen the news also from Spain, where this week they opened their first exhibition, the HIP Expo, the uh, hospitality industry exhibition at IFEMA, um, which was supported by the national government. Uh, and in fact, at the closing ceremony, um, I think yesterday, the Spanish Minister of Tourism, Commerce and Industry uh, supported the, the closing event and also took part in the Spanish uh, National Association AFE's uh, general meeting. So congratulations to Spain. And in fact, this was preceded uh, two weeks ago by an announcement that FITUR, Spain's leading uh, international tourism and travel show, would go ahead in May, May the 19th, with the full support of the national and Madrid government, and indeed Iberia, and that Spain would be open for business. So we're very pleased to have Maria Valgarce, the director of FITUR, with us today. Uh, after looking at the Spanish case, we'll move to Holland, uh, whereby they also have been uh, working in close cooperation with the authorities there towards a safe return. Uh, they've been doing some pilot events back to life, and we have Rima uh, Rick Kamer. Uh, apologies if I pronounce your, your name wrong, Rima, but Rima is the director of CLC Vector, which is the industry association for the live events industry in Holland, and I'm pleased to say new UFI members. Uh, and also Peter Lovitz, the CEO of Backbone International, um, who will be talking us through what's going on in Holland. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Maria. Um, hello, Maria. Good afternoon, Madrid. Hello. <laughs> How are Hi. you? Good, thank you. So, so, so I guess briefly, if we could just start to, if you could give us, uh, you know, just a brief update on the situation in, in Spain in general. Well, uh, good afternoon, Nick and everybody. 
Uh, I am very pleased of being here with you this afternoon. And thank you for the invitation to, to UFI and, and to UNIC. Uh, I want to send a warm greeting to all, to all the audience with a message of courage and a message of resilience from Spain in these hard times for, for our industry. And uh, answering your question about the situation in Spain nowadays, well, uh, refer to the pandemic. We are now in a not very bad situation, in a medium situation. We seem to have overcome the third wave of the, of the pandemic here. And using the, the standard rate of reference that we use, which is the number of notified new cases within the last 14 days, uh, the figure for Spain now is 145. So that, it, that is a, a yellow, a, a signal, a, a medium rate of, of risk. Um, now, Spain public administration is making big efforts to control the pandemic uh, and avoid uh, another wave, a new wave, uh, putting very strong measures to prevent mobility um, inside the country so that we don't have a uh, risk during Easter holidays because uh, normally the new waves are related to periods of holidays uh, with increases in mobility. So now the common objective here in Spain is a good touristic uh, summer campaign. So that's uh, for what is uh, talking about the pandemic. And about IFEMA, about my company, as you have already said, we are, uh, present, we are now uh, presently uh, celebrating the first of our exhibitions uh, this year. And it is uh, the one that you have mentioned. It is called uh, uh, Hospitality Innovation Planet. And it is a third uh, for, the, for the hospitality industry. It is still uh, now being celebrated. So it started on March the, the 22nd and it lasts till tomorrow. Uh, today we have received the visit of the Ministry of Industry, as you said. And uh, well, I think this exhibition has uh, brought uh, a breath of fresh air to, to Madrid and to, to our industry. Uh, so, well, now we, of course, we have applied very strict protocols concerning the anti-COVID control. And uh, after that, after this exhibition, we are celebrating uh, in April a fashion week show. Uh, and then uh, another exhibition uh, aimed to the general public uh, about contemporary art. And after that, in May, uh, Fitur. So that's the general situation here now. Great, thank you. And I guess, you know, what's really encouraging um, is the amount of support, as you mentioned, that the ministry and, and the various levels of your government. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear around the world that, you know, some countries value exhibitions and they understand our industry better than others. Um, you know, it, it, here in the UK for most of last year, we were kind of fighting for that recognition and all the industries that were kind of being mentioned, you know, ours, ours was not. Um, you know, and when you look at Germany, for example, in Europe, you know, very early on in May of last year, uh, the government said that the federal government, that exhibitions are different to mass gatherings. You know, they should have a different classification. Um, that's sort of in contrast with what's happening now in Germany. But, you know, how did this come about? You know, obviously, you know, this is a kind of leading um, tourism show, which has, you know, the support of the ministry and you're in touch with, you know, ministries of, of, of other countries around the world. But to get this sort of level of backing, is this something that's always been there or is this something that you've been working with? Um, you know, what was the role of, of, of IFEMA or, or potentially AFE? You know, how, how, how okay. did this come mm -hmm. about? Well, we have quite a continuous relationship uh, with the Spanish public administration, uh, because uh, we have a wide range of, of uh, portfolio of events and uh, in relation with different industries. And uh, everybody recognizes that IFEMA activity is very relevant uh, for the generation of, of uh, wealth and employment and for the economy of, of Madrid and Spain. So, uh, 
that is general uh, related to all the activity in IFEMA. In the case of FITUR, uh, we have an organizing committee chaired by, by the president of, of Iberia. And this committee includes uh, the, the creme de la creme the, the, of tourism industry in, in Spain. Uh, we have uh, the maximum and direct rep representative of uh, the tourism in Spain, which is the Secretary of State for Tourism, uh, a vice minister uh, of the central government. We have within this committee uh, the maximum responsible of the Spanish tourism promotion entity. Uh, we have top representatives of IATA. Uh, we have the Secretary General of the World uh, Tourism Organization. I mean, uh, all the important decision makers uh, in Madrid regional and local government and so on. So uh, that group that we work with for the organization of FITUR is, uh, is very strong and they give us full support. And uh, well, the thing is that um, tourism in the case of, of, of the Spanish economy is a, a question of state. Uh, tourism is one is the major is the most important industry in for Spanish economy. Uh, it is uh, if we take the the figures of uh, of uh, 2019, uh, it is uh, uh, an industry responsible for more than 12 percent of the gross uh, domestic product, and for also more than than 12 percent of the of the employment. And also it has been declared the most competitive industry in the world by the World Economic Forum um, several years. So for us, it's, it is um, and for, for the Spanish economy and for the Spanish government, uh, FITUR is a platform that represents that strength of our touristic industry. And maybe that's why uh, we have always uh, in this long story, because you know, uh, FITUR has already celebrated 40 editions. Uh, we have had a very, very strong support uh, coming from all uh, public administrations and especially uh, from the, the state, uh, the Spanish government. W wonderful, thank you. I mean, I guess, yes, clearly having such a kind of creme de la creme on your, on your organizing committee, you know, makes all the difference, you know, enables a shortcut to all these, you know, important international bodies. But, but even so, I guess, you know, of course, all of us in every industry, you know, we put safety first, you know, we put the safety of our guests, our tourists, um, you know, our, our, our delegates, our exhibitors. Um, but, but while, you know, even we can't figure out the international travel question and, and people are kind of lobbying for, for vaccine or testing certifications, you know, to, to get to that decision whereby, you know, yes, we're going to come out and say, you know, that Spain will be open for business. Of course, we don't know what will happen. Of course, you know, there's many ifs or buts. But, you know, I guess many countries will be looking and saying, you know, why can't our tourism ministers, you know, and, and why can't, you know, align with our businesses, you know, almost, you know, above and beyond what the health ministers might be saying. So, so again, you know, you know, do you do you have any insight into how how you managed to? You know, it must have been a tricky decision. <laughs> well, we we had planned uh, celebrating uh, Fitur in January as every year, and uh, after the summer, we we started um, realizing that it, it was it was not going to be possible, and uh, after the summer, with that view of the situation with the pandemic, we began to, to review the planning of all the first. And we started contacts with all players uh, in, in touristic industry. Uh, in fact, it was uh, IFMA general director, Eduardo Lopez Puertas, who led these efforts. And uh, he had several conversations with the Minister of Tourism, with the airlines and well, with, uh, with other instances which were important players in, in this market. And uh, well, uh, we wanted to, to reflect uh, on an alternative plan uh, for the celebration of FITUR and uh, searching for dates in which uh, the mobility and the international connectivity would be 
could be at least partially restored. So, uh, well, we, after that research or pre-research, uh, we called uh, a meeting of the organizing committee and uh, that was in October, around the 20th. And uh, in that meeting, we decided to move uh, the FITUR to, to the month of May. Uh, of course, we are going to apply very strict protocols uh, regarding the, the COVID, uh, the pandemic situation. And, uh, but we think that it, it is possible to, to celebrate a, an exhibition uh, taking care of, of this, uh, of all the health uh, safety conditions, because uh, in fact, uh, there are a lot of activities similar that produce uh, gatherings similar to, to the one that we produce in exhibitions and that are presently uh, allowed. Uh, let's think on a commercial uh, a mall or any establishment uh, for, for the commerce that uh, bring a lot of people together and as long as you have the distances and you control the people inside the rooms and uh, put in a, a series of, of measures, you can do it uh, with, uh, with the, the, the level that you want of, of, uh, of um, safety. So what we have um, developed is a, a strict protocol that is going to be applied in Fitur and in other exhibitions the protocol is not exactly the same depending on the on the activity because it adapts to the pattern of the visit or the pattern of the participation for example in professional uh, exhibitions uh, the interaction uh, and the face-to-face -face meetings are are very frequent and the interaction is very intense there's a lot of meetings inside uh, rooms and uh, people stay longer uh, but in general public uh, exhibitions, uh, people go around, have a few contacts, and it's, it's a totally different pattern. So we work in, in different protocols that adapt to different situations, and we are uh, certain that we are going to, to celebrate FITUR in a, in a, um, a sanitary uh, health uh, safety situation, which is uh, going to be uh, the, the right one and, and good enough for our participants. Great, thank you. And, you know, we all, again, 100% agree that there's, you know, different types of events. You cannot count, you know, let's say 50,000 people coming to a football match or, or a music concert, um, you know, over a period of hours, the same as 50,000 people coming to a trade show over three or four days. Um, even though in the UK, that's that's still what we do. You know, the, the, a trade exhibition is the same as a wedding or Glastonbury Festival, which, you know, isn't necessarily logical. So we have some questions coming in um, for Maria. So I guess first, if we want to go to Paris, to Marta Gomez uh, from Vipari, who has a question about the exhibitors of the door. Marta, hi. Hi, Maria. Thank you so much hi. for sharing your experiences today. Um, I had, yes, I had a question about when you so you have you have an exhibition that's open today how long before did you get the green light from the government because generally we know that there needs to be a bit of a lead time uh, between when exhibitors are uh, you know starting to fall away because they don't uh, they're, they're they're not confident the show is going to go be going ahead so there needs to be a bit of announcement time before actual reopening how how long did you have prior to the show it is allowed in Spain to to hold exhibitions nowadays. Ah, okay. uh, only only that uh, you have to present the plan, the, what we call the contingency plan, uh, explaining all the measures that you develop, and then you have like the confirmation of the allowance. But, so it was uh, never uh, banned no, it was, in Spain. No, okay. No only that you have to adapt to the rules of the moment. And in, for example, during the, the well, where we were uh, all in our houses, of course, that, that wasn't uh, possible. But nowadays uh, we are planning all, all the exhibitions that we are going to, to celebrate in 2021. Uh, I mean, advancing and, and taking contact with all exhibitors and visitors and so on and developing the, the protocols for the anti-COVID. 
and then you have to present the protocols to the authority, to the regional government authority, and have the confirmation of the, you know, that that, that everything is uh, okay and it's, uh, um, um, well, prepared to, to, to open. To open. Hmm. And, and you do this how long before the show? Is it two, three months? About one, it... no, uh, the last confirmation is about one month before but it's, it is not forbidden. So we, we go on preparing and then uh, preparing the protocol and then we have the confirmation. And I have another question, if I may, Nick, I'm sorry, I'm asking lots of questions. Uh, do you have, um, uh, do you have uh, uh, international exhibitors and visitors yes. that you expect at these shows? And has yes. that been harder than the national ones to convince? Of course, yes, yes. Well, nowadays we have around 65% of the net uh, surface that we had last edition. We could celebrate our 2020 exhibition because uh, it was in January, just before all of, all of this pandemic uh, developed. So, uh, and we had a very good um, edition that time. And uh, nowadays we have like 65% of what we had uh, at that time. And uh, of course, the national, uh, the domestic uh, participants, uh, domestic de destinations are most of it. They participate exactly in the same measure that they did last time. So they have the same spaces. They have very big surfaces and, and very strong uh, representation. And on the international part, it is, uh, it is not like that. It is more fragile, it is changing every day. And in this moment, we have 50 countries participating, which is not a bad figure, but uh, FITUR usually gets uh, more than 150. Last time it was 165 countries participating. So of course it's going to be smaller, it is going to be less international, but it is going to be there and and it is going to happen so i think that's, that's what... wonderful news yeah <laughs> thank you th thank you marta so so we did have a question from uh diogo barbosa who's in porto which i guess is southwest of you but i think that was answered so we th there's another question er from eric we'll come to that which is looking forward i guess we'll come back to that after um we move over to holland because i'm aware that raima has to has to jump off so thank you maria we we'll, we'll definitely have some more questions for you um but if i could ask uh rima to to, to say hi and and just introduce yourself and, and briefly give us an update on on the situation in holland thank you Rima. Yeah, there it is. Okay, it's there. Right. Okay, okay. Good afternoon, you all. So, thank you for inviting us, um, Peter and me, um, to present our field lab program and share our experience with, that, with you. Thank you, Nick, for the invitation and Albert Aar from Jabers Utrecht for introducing us. Uh, I'm Rima Rijkma. I'm director of the uh, Dutch Association for Live Communication, CLC Effecta, and I represent the corporate event market in our relation to the government and the Field Lab program. Um, <clears throat> I think that the industry never faced a crisis as COVID before. It hits the whole industry, the worldwide, and no exceptions. And I think the only way to fight this pandemic was to work together and to forget mutual contradictions. Um, in our industry, we all felt the same urgency and working together became naturally, uh, so we did with the, all the Dutch associations. Uh, we had this challenge because our industry was not well organized, and to be organized is a very important condition to be successful in government uh, advocacy. And uh, the big challenge was to convince the authorities about the relevance, uh, to convince them about the economic consequences, the continuity, the employment perspective, and also the financial support we need as an industry, but also measures or a research to reopen. So it took a lot of energy, but we were rewarded with several live and digital sessions with the ministers. And we agreed to start a community of practice to find measures that make a faster reopening of the industry possible. So that makes the Field Lab uh, program born. So it was an initiative of the entire event sector, business to business, business to consumer, meeting and conventions, exhibitions, all kinds of events. 
it was set up in a collaboration with the Dutch ministries of justice, health, culture, economics, and the Dutch scientific community. And uh, uh, we had to start uh, to form a team and uh, we formed a balanced team from professionals, several uh, professionals to start this program. So to make it short, my introduction, because I think it's very important that everybody gets the opportunity to ask a lot of questions because uh, I think they, there are a lot of questions after the presentation of Peter. So I'm proud to uh, introduce Peter. He is the leader of the Field Lab program in the Netherlands. And he will uh, give us a short presentation about the program and the outcome, the first outcome of the program, of the test, Peter. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Lord Rima. And just to say, you know, thank, thank you again. And we look forward to, to coming to Holland to, to, you know, we'll be in Ahoy in, in Rotterdam in November um, in, in your house for our, for our UFI Congress. Let's, let's hope that it's, it's all okay then. Of course it will be. <laughs> Peter. Yes, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Peter Lubert. Uh, in a normal event life, I'm a managing partner of a, uh, of a company called Backbone International. We are a production management company, technical production, overlay management, and, uh, and technical design. Uh, we work for festivals, corporate events, sports events, uh, like the Formula One. We work for the UEFA, uh, and we work worldwide. We have an office here in, in Amsterdam. That's the, the European office. We also have an, uh, an office in, uh, in North America, in Hong Kong, and we have an office in Indonesia. Um, well, at this moment, we don't have any events at all in the Netherlands. Let's say we have a, a few, but it's not as much as we, uh, we wanted to have. So I started in July as program manager of Field Lab events. Um, I will share a PowerPoint presentation with you all. Uh, as yeah. And as Rima already told, it's a collaboration between uh, the whole uh, event uh, industry uh, with collaboration with uh, uh, the authorities and the scientific community. And what's very important is that the goal are, is how to reduce the spread of uh, COVID-19 at events by limiting the influx of infected people, uh, but also set up an alternative for the genetic measures. And it's very important here in the Netherlands, so the, the social distancing measure, the one and a half meter, because with that measure we have here uh, uh, embedded in the law, it's for us not possible to have a lack of less, let's say a healthy uh, business model. Uh, so what we're, our aim is how can we look for uh, an acceptable residual risk at events? So how can we, do, can we reduce the spread of COVID on events, but uh, still have more uh, visitors capacity on our events? So we started up with uh, creating the customer journey of an event and in every phase of the customer journey, journey, we are able to influence our visitor, but also influence uh, the, the spread of COVID at our events. And we call that, uh, and you see here the, the customer journey, and as we call it, our controlled situation in the phase when the people arrive at the uh, at our event and leave the event. And hold on, Peter, can you go to pre yes. presentation? Just to, can you go to presentation mode? We're still seeing the like welcome. Oh, yeah. the kind of that's strange. Mm -hmm. Let's try again. Yeah, we didn't actually see the first slide. We're still looking at the... Still don't have the, the customer journey slide? Yes, I mean, we can see all the slides. You know, it's still not in presentation mode. If you, oh, if you... well, that, that's, well, that's strange then. Well, but no, we can see the slide. Well, I well, I, I, I will do it like now, this. Now, now we can see the, yeah, great. Yeah, I'll do it like this. Otherwise, <laughs> it takes too long. So, uh, customer, customer journey, we see the, the, what we call as phase three and four is what we call our controlled situation. And this is where you enter the venue or the event. And afterwards you leave. And in, in that phase, you, you can control the, the spread of risk of, of COVID. What's very important for us is that we created a, a diversification of our events. Um, we just heard before, and it also was in the Netherlands, the government says every event is the same because we have a lot of people together. And we say per event type, you have uh, another risk level or you can create 
let's say, more um, 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 opportunities to reduce the spread of risk on several events. So we created uh, four event types called indoor passive. You can say let's uh, a theater or a corporate event or uh, what we call a seminar or a convention. We said the type two is an indoor active. Uh, you can say a, an indoor sports event or a concert or a dance uh, event indoors. Outdoor active, it's the number three type. An outdoor concert, but also maybe a football match. Uh, and as the four type is the outdoor active, but then the festival setting where people walk from area to area. So we created a, a, a whole research program with all scientists um, and said, Let, let's create pilot events and measure real and gain real data. And with the data, we can say something about the real uh, risk of uh, infection risks on, on events, because now we say everything is a risk, but if we know the real risks, we can, as an organization and as an event industry, we can do something about those risks. So we created uh, eight pilot events and we did in the last couple of weeks, we did a corporate event um, um, and convention uh, on the 15th of February with 500 people. We did a theater show. We did two football matches. Uh, we had a, an indoor dance event and an indoor concert uh, two weeks ago. And last weekend we had a festival, a dance festival and a music festival with 1500 uh, visitors. So what was very important that people realized that they were part of a, a scientific study. Uh, and what's very important is we, it was not meant as a medical examination because uh, we're not measuring how many people are infected or not infected during event. We're just looking at what are the real infection risks on an event. Um, what was very important upfront is, is that everybody that was uh, participating in, the, in, the, in one of the pilot events had a Corona PCR test upfront within 48 hours. Um, we did triage, we did temperature readings, and was very important, we scaled um, the event and we divided it in, as we call it, bubbles. So we had several uh, dedicated groups of people that had their own entrance, their own bars, their own toilets, and their own seated or a specific place in the in the venue and did not have contact with any other of the, of the bubbles. Afterwards, we asked people to not have contact with uh, vulnerable uh, groups for five uh, and, until 10 days. And uh, most of the people were, uh, had a follow-up PCR test after, afterwards. That was very helpful for our, uh, let's say, are there people infected and can we help our national uh, healthcare organization in uh, reducing the spread afterwards? So I told you a little bit about the bubbles. Here you see uh, one of the uh, Zingerdome arenas here in the, in the Netherlands and we divided the whole venue in several groups and every group has their specific uh, measure so we can um, compare every way of the bubbles with the, with other bubbles so some of the bubbles people can stand wherever they want uh, in some of the bubbles people were standing let's say in a normal concert situation with three at one square meter and on the grandstand where people were, were sitting in let's say a chessboard or were asked to sit down and we're just looking for uh, several things on these uh, pilots. But what's very important is what we did is a research for at behavior. Are people willing to uh, cooperate with the measures we tell them to? Are they wearing their mouth mouth? Are they, if we ask them not to share and to shout and to scream and to sing, are they willing to do that? Uh, how will people, when you ask them to, to stay in some of the bubbles, are they willing to stay on their place or are they moving uh, or, are they gathering close to each other, et cetera, et cetera. So we can have some, let's say, a lot of information between uh, the kind of seated or non-seated settings. Uh, very important for us here in the Netherlands was rapid testing. Uh, we did rapid testing at the venue as well. We're just looking at the logistics at rapid testing. But just to be clear, we're not, we think that uh, central uh, rapid testing, let's say uh, testing at an event uh, venue, it's not going to happen here in the Netherlands. We call it decentral testing. So uh, through all the country, we're going to have test locations. And when you want to go to an event, you can have your rapid test up front. Then afterwards, you go to an event, but it will not take place at the venue itself. Air quality was one of our uh, 
topics we did research uh, at, at the pilot events what's the influence of uh, air quality outdoor indoor uh, and how can we influence the the quality of the air very important part of our research program was physical dynamics uh, and we said how many contacts and how many moments and contact moments are there between visitors what are the distances in between uh, those uh, visitors and what was the duration between the, uh, the visitors so everybody that gets in into the pilot gets a tag and with the tag we can measure all kind of data regarding contact moments contact duration and distancing so what, what are the real results afterwards so um, what we notice that uh, one of uh, 0 0.65 percent of the people were tested up front uh, were tested positive without that they even know they were uh, tested or they were positive as well. So upfront, we detected, let's say, 41 positives in the first six events for people who didn't know they were positive. Um, we did the triage questions and the temperature reading. We had no dropouts. So we think that uh, a temperature uh, reading or real triage questions uh, at the door is not one of the results we're going to uh, embed in our events here in the Netherlands. We had a corona report app that was uh, that gives you uh, a signal when you have contact with somebody who has been tested positive and it was very helpful for our, uh, our research afterwards so after uh, four um uh, the, the post events we we had is uh, let's say we had one positive uh, infection infection uh, positive afterwards after the um, the convention it happened that the, the this, this visitor was not infectious during the event. After the theater, we had no inf uh, positives as well. And at the football match matches, we had three positives who were not um, infectious during the event. And after the concert, we have probably four positives. And we think, and it with the, with the scientists and with the Dutch uh, uh, healthcare in the Netherlands, uh, it's probably that they were not infected at the event or were infectious at the event at all. So these results says uh, something about pre-testing. And we say that it's very positive if, in, if we can have, let's say rapid test upfront for an event, that should be the big game changer here in, in the Netherlands. So uh, we also did the visitor dynamics, as I mentioned before, you see here, let's say um, uh, how many contacts people have in a specific bubble uh, you can see that the the, the context uh, rates are really low at the theater setting it was almost the same at the, the convention um, and what we also did is how can we measure uh, visitor dynamics during let's say the break on a theater show and what the real nice thing about this one is that we can see that people were having as let's say a natural uh, social distancing during during a break so what we created is a risk model. And we created it with, in a correlation with one of our universities here in the Netherlands and say, if you have all the data uh, uh, you, we get from the, from the pilots, but also know what the preference, the infected rate in the, the Netherlands is, but also do uh, upfront testing. So pre-testing with PCR or with a rapid test, you can have all kinds of data regarding air quality, or how you create your event design, are you working with bubbles, routes, uh, and personal protection? Um, and you have the data with all the, the contacts we were gaining during the pilot events, close contacts or far uh, contacts. Uh, they put it in one risk model. And then you can say in what risk level, when you are here in the Netherlands, we have a high risk level. Um, uh, and that's that we're now in the highest risk infection uh, risk we have now right now in, in the Netherlands. What can you say about the real uh, risks regarding, let's say, go to an event or just what's happening in society when you stay at home or you go to school or you have uh, go to a shop? Uh, and that's what we care on comparing here in the, in the Netherlands. So we say how safe it is to go to an event in compar comparison with going to um, let's say school or stay at home and have some visitors at home. So the real, the first insights and learnings we have is that we can see that 
in the highest risk uh, level. We are now, right now here in the Netherlands and you go to a theater, you can, uh, with more than 50% visitors capacity, it's still more safe to go to an event than stay home and uh, um, have visitors at your home or go to uh, a school or whatever. Um, it's also that you can, if you create bubbles inside your event, the infection rate and the risk is going much lower. So you can have more capacity, visit capacity at your event when you as an organization can influence the, the, the risk model you, you just uh, saw before. So as an, uh, an organizer or an, uh, a venue, you can really control your contact moments uh, and your contact duration, and you can really reduce the spread of risk on, on COVID. So that, was, that are the first learnings we have right now. It's from a theater show and from a convention. But we're also looking for a dance event. We're looking for uh, festivals and the same risk model um, we're using to um, measure and calculate real risks on an event when you take a lot of messages. For example, uh, a pre-testing, for example, wearing a mouth mask, but also your air quality, etc. If you put that in a risk model, you create real safe um, uh, events here, uh, what we see here in the Netherlands. And now we're talking with our government is how to implant that risk model and also uh, looking at the way, how can we uh, start reopening our event industry step by step by uh, increasing the, um, the visitors capacity on our events with the certain measure we're having and we're, uh, we're researching right now here in the Netherlands. So that's, that's a smart brief of how we create our field lab events uh, program. Amazing, thank you, thank you, Peter, for that detailed presentation. The first one is just because there were quite a few uh, questions in the chat. Just to double confirm that you're okay to share that uh, your your slides with everybody. Um, well, not all, all data is already published, so we cannot share everything. But it was the first insight we have, and in the upcoming week, we're going to share this with um, with our government as well. Okay, so so, but whatever you can share with us, because tomorrow we, we, we send a recording uh, and some notes, and we can we'll share whatever you're you're happy to share with us. Um, thank you for that. And I guess the million dollar question, you know, at, at the beginning you mentioned that you know you're working across various um, government agencies and, and, and ministries. You know, the million dollar question is is what's next? You know, what is the timeline for reopening as as you understand it? Yeah, that's, that's very important because we have the four event types. So we, we, we did it, uh, the pilot events in the last couple of weeks and we need to analyze the data. Um, um, and we need three to seven weeks to analyze and to come up with um, a recommendation to uh, our government. So we think in uh, the upcoming week, we're gonna have a recommendation uh, regarding uh, corporate shows um, uh, uh, conventions, theater shows, classical concerts, etc. And in the upcoming weeks afterwards, we're going to have recommendations for every event type. The, also, the next step we're going to uh, have in an, an upcoming weeks in April and in May, that's we're going to have what we call increased capacity events. So with all the insights we have from, uh, uh, from the field lab pilot events, we're going to have uh, events with more capacity. For example, in the upcoming weekend, we're gonna have a football match with 5,000 visitors. Um, and we're gonna increase that number during the upcoming upcoming weeks um, and gain more uh, data regarding, let's say, increasing our visit capacity and see what's happening on the really contact moments and uh, the infection risk on events. Perfect, thank you. And, and I guess obviously, you know, you, you're working with the combined industry inside Holland. Um, there was another uh, comment or a question from, from Marta in Paris, which said, look, this would be because, you know, France is working on similar pilot events. In the UK, we, you know, we, we have, or well, we were running last year and, and are again planning our own. You know, everybody's kind of doing the same work individually. You know, would it be possible or, or, or you know, is there is there any plans to kind of share it with our European, you know, to get a kind of European standardization uh, which means that you know we can kind of fast track other other countries you know along the same protocols or, or the same learnings 
I think learnings uh, and sharing the learnings should be very helpful for everybody. I think it's we we thought about it to to do this in, in European collaboration with each other, but we see that all governments has their own, let's say, roadmap or uh, way of working. So yes, sharing is absolutely very important, and we are really open for that. Uh, get up with a, a European protocol. I think, yeah, it will take too long, but. Uh, let's try, and that's very important to share. Let's uh, let's start with sharing. Great, sure. thank you. So, so, okay, so so we have about how long? Just about fourteen minutes left. So, if you have any questions for either Peter or Maria, please let us know in the chat. So, there was a question earlier for Maria from Eric, who I think is with GL in Nice. So, Eric, if you can hear us, please, we're coming to you. Um, un unmute your microphone, and that's looking forward because you you mentioned Maria that. Um, you know, 50 countries out of 165 uh, that are typically exhibit at theatre will be represented this year. Um, just, you know, overall with, with Ifema's, with yours and other shows, um, I think he wanted to um, ask you about that. So, so Eric, are you, are you still with us and can you hear us? I am. Thank you, Nick. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Peter, for your great insight and presentation. Uh, as you said, Nick, I have the million dollar question which is realistically, when do you expect to go back to pre-COVID levels for the exhibition industry and starting with which region and how? Thank you. So Maria, that was, that was, yes. Is it, is it a, a question for me? I'm uh, sorry, yes. I thought it was for Peter. Okay, first I, I would like to congratulate Peter for the presentation. It was excellent and very interesting. Well, pre-COVID level, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, now the exhibition that we are now celebrating in IFEMA, it's around 30% uh, in size to what it was in its last, last edition. I hope that FITUR will remain around this 65% that we, we have now in our reservations. But uh, I think that the pre-COVID level that will depend uh, not only on the development of the pandemics, but also the consequences of the big crisis that this pandemic uh, is, is causing in, in different industries. So for the tourism, for the tourism, I, I hope that there will be a strong growth after after the pandemic, I mean, when when uh, a big part of the population has been uh, vaccinated and so, and and then I hope that maybe in twenty three we will have a, a normal future again. But in other industries, it, it depends on on how the the pandemic has uh, has been uh causing uh, a big crisis or not we for example we are celebrating in autumn uh, several uh, exhibitions related to to construction and uh, in in spain the the construction is, is still working and they don't have such a a big um strike from from the the pandemic so maybe that exhibitions will return earlier to to its normal size but it i think it it depends on on the sector great thank you and we have another question for you maria this is from uh, barbara jameson who's from the best city in the world london <laughs> um. yeah the, one of many many best cities of the world <laughs> every city is great <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I've just got a question because um, everyone obviously has been talking about hybrid events and, and then virtu the virtual element. So a question for Maria, you know, it's fabulous that you're able to organise um, FITA and other events. But what about the business model? Uh, are you then looking at or do you have enough attendees to, to deliver your return on investment or are you getting extra return on investment from a virtual paid audience um how, how is that working okay well in the case of fitur and several other uh, exhibitions that ifema organizes we are uh, having the, the the physical or the presential uh, show together with a platform a virtual platform that enlarges the 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 reach uh, to both exhibitors and and visitors 
uh, we are having that in Fitur. It, uh, it will be named uh, Fitur Life Connect. And uh, in parallel to, to the celebration of, of the show in normal, I mean, the, the physical celebration of the show, we have this platform that we will open uh, on the 5th of May and it will be open till the 6th, I think, of June, one month. And yeah. during that month, uh, this platform will be useful for visitors and visitors to, to get in contact, to prepare, in the case of people that will attend to Madrid, uh, to prepare the, the days of, of the physical show. And in the case of people that don't, uh, that, that uh, won't be able to travel, uh, to make contact and, and well, this will allow to, to show the, um, the products and the destinations and uh, produce uh, networking mm -hmm. and uh, well, give a compliment uh, to, to the show, to the, to the, uh, the physical show. Yeah, fabulous, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And, and if I could ask the same question to Peter, actually, about, you know, because this is, again, what, what most organisers are indeed, you know, struggling with now is, is, the, is the future business model. You know, the, the, what, how do you see this? Because are you just kind of um, obviously, you know, looking at the practicalities of getting these events back or, or already are you looking at a different kind of model being built in? Well, from the, the field, uh, field lab program for the short term period is that we're really looking for how can we reopen our event industry and how can we reopen with uh, more visitors capacity and at the end, the main goal is how to get back to 100% and uh, somewhere back to, to normal. Uh, I, I still believe that for this upcoming period, we are, are in a between phase that we have to calculated with uh, measures like rapid testing and mouth mask and uh, some way of uh, avoiding contact moments but yeah afterwards yeah of course hybrid events will still be part of it but we see here in the Netherlands that that people are really looking forward to go and meet uh, in, in a life situation uh, that's why we called our uh, theme of our campaign called back to life because that's the main goal for this upcoming period Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, if any more question, Rima's back. Can you you'd like to say something to add, Rima? Oh, you can unmute yourself, Rima. Uh, now it's the worst, yes. Yes. Um, but I think that the the hybrid uh, concept. I think that um, of course we are working to get life again because that's I think our main perspective. But on the other hand, I think that the hybrid component, I think it has to be realistic. That's something that's going to happen. But it can also be a, a, an opportunity to make our events bigger, uh, to make it possible for more people to join our events in an other sort of way. So um, I think that's it's impossible. I think it's a challenge for us to see it positive. And of course, we are working to, to get our exhibitions back to the standard as we used to. Um, but on the other hand, I think uh, we also have to see it like as, a, as a challenge. And the other thing, I think the biggest challenge for us in Holland and the Netherlands, where the situation at the moment is very critical, is to make a sort of an uh, agreement or to develop a sort of a, a map with the government uh, with data or date to, uh, to, to see uh, on which terms we can reopen because we need our preparation time and also we have to work on the emotion of the exhibitors and the visitors. So I think that's a very big challenge for us to uh, find a way to, to come to an agreement with the government that we have a sort of a, a, a roadmap uh, to a moment that we say, okay, when we are in, th in that situation, it's possible to reopen in a normal way. So I think that's our biggest challenge to make an agreement with the government at, that mo at uh, this moment about this specific issue, uh, because that's what we need. And that's also the perspective uh, which everybody is, uh, is aiming for. 
Thank, thank you, Rima. Um, I, I mean, just so thank you all for your contributions. Uh, you know, and it's 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 great to see all of you on 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 the call. We've we've looked at um, Spain and Holland today, but we're obviously keeping tabs on on all the other European countries. Uh, and I think we mentioned in the chat, but you know, at UFI we have our on the ufi.org/coronavirus resource page. Um, the market tracker, and we're trying to keep track of, of different markets and when they're open. Um, before we close, I mean, Ma we have Marcus Geisenberger from Leipzig in Germany, just wondering if you could give us a very brief update on what uh, what's happening in Germany, you know, our, our, our leading country in Europe in terms of exhibitions, before we wrap up. Thanks, Nick. I'll be happy to, uh, first of all, congratulations to all these good initiatives and best of luck that uh, the the event will work out the way you thought it, it will be. So it ho hopefully brings a lot of positive examples because we need that. Uh, Nick, you shortly described the situation in Germany. Uh, actually last year in May, uh, we had a good ground of discussions. Um, everybody understood that exhibitions have another legal ground than mass events in Germany. And all of a sudden it, it got mixed up uh, in the process of the discussions. Uh, usually we have an event uh, in Leipzig, which is uh, from the Chaos Computer Club. It's the largest hacking event in the world with 18,000. Uh, the media described the German uh, government as a Chaos Corona Club uh, just recently um, because they're mixing things up. And unfortunately, our discussion about exhibitions um, has been sorted as part of uh, mass events. So we are back to point zero. So um, uh, it's, it's, we actually expected these days to get some positive signals um, for the next few weeks and months, but it turned completely the other way. Um, of course, given the situation is not an easy one, but uh, so far we're waiting for, for these signals urgently. And as we all know, uh, it takes a lot uh, of time to get restarted again. At the same time, we have several mo uh, uh, model projects um, that we are starting and that have run uh, a little similar uh, to what was described. And we hope to get uh, some, uh, the okay from the government to run uh, these, these projects so uh, we can prove that uh, we are responsible and we take care of the uh, health issues and, uh, and, and all this. So, um, so far, no good news. All the more we need the good examples from other countries. Thank you, Marcus. Um, okay, so I, you know, apologies if we didn't get to your questions. If you want to email me, nick, N-I-C-K, at ufi.org, um, I can forward it on to the speakers and get get that feedback to you. Um, so just I'd just like to thank you, thank once again our speakers, uh, Maria Valcarce from Fitur in Efema, um, Peter Lovitz uh, and Rima Ripkema um, from Holland. And a very quick show of hands if you're keen to attend Fitur or the Dutch event whenever it uh, whenever it first opened. Um, you know, I think we all know we're, we're really looking forward to to running our events again. Really looking forward to to meeting up again. Um, you know, and hopefully by, as Rima said, by, you know, this year working together and collaborating more, um, we can all ensure the speedy um, return of our events. So, um, Pascal, if you can share a slide just to show you um, what's happening next week. Um, so next week, you know, many of you will have been aware that it, those venue members that last year you were called upon to support as temporary hospitals, and now they are being used as vaccination centers temporarily. Um, so we have, we published, you may not have seen it, um, hopefully the UFI team can post a link in the chat to a good practice guidance um, on using your venue as a vaccination center. Um, so that's put together by Glenn Schoen. He will be moderating this session next week um, with Ali Abdul Kader from Dubai World Trade Center, Fernanda Askar from Sao Paulo Tourism Board, and Alan Steele from uh, the Javits Center in New York. So please join us then. My final uh, message is to thank our UFI Diamond sponsors, uh, the Thailand Convention and Exhibition Bureau, TSEB, the Qatar National Tourism Council, Shenzhen World, and Freeman. So thank you to all of them. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, please do tune in again for another one. Um, and we look forward to seeing you hopefully live very soon.